Hey everybody, welcome back. Let's knock out a few more chapters here. We're going to do chapters 56 and 57 tonight. I just want to mention though that since we just did the Easter Vigil, chapters 40, 54 and 55 actually have passages that are used in the Easter Vigil. Pretty cool. Uh, so the very two last installments of this class, uh, those chapters are chosen, selected for the high solemnity, high feast or solemnity of the entire liturgical year, the Easter Vigil. Pretty awesome. So um, let's, um, and of course, 53 was on Good Friday. So anyway, uh, these are critically important texts in salvation history that have been chosen uh, for the most important liturgies, the whole... Um, Ground zero of the Paschal Mystery, Good Friday and the Easter Vigil. Uh, so anyway, now tonight we're going to do 56 and 57, which are extremely rich as well. So buckle up and let's get started. First of all, let's just notice that, as we said at the outset of this whole class, you have Isaiah split up into three sections, chapters 1 through 39, then chapters 40 to 55. Now, chapters 56 to 66 are the final portion. So sometimes scholars call it Isaiah. And then Deutero-Isaiah is 40 to 55. And then Trito-Isaiah is 56 to 66. I still hold or maintain the position that one guy, Isaiah, wrote the whole thing. I'm just a simple guy. Uh, and that's what I think. But uh, but anyway, um, so tonight 56 begins this third portion of Isaiah. And what's noteworthy about it is that Isaiah is now preaching to the exiles who have returned to Jerusalem now. So he's no longer preaching to them in exile in Babylon, uh, but to them after they have returned. So let's see what we have here. Chapter 56, verse 1. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness. For soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. Let's stop right there and notice uh, what is he talking about? Because no longer are they in exile awaiting for their salvation from Babylon. Okay, they have been released from their bondage in uh, Babylon, and they've uh, been allowed to return when Persia takes over and conquers Babylon, and King Cyrus sends the Israelites back. Uh, <clears throat> and yet God is talking about a salvation here that he's going to uh, bring about. Soon my salvation will come, my deliverance be revealed, but he's not talking about Babylon. So he's talking about something much deeper than that, much more expansive, much more far-reaching. He's talking about the salvation or deliverance of the nations, of the whole world from its bondage to slavery and death and the devil. So that's ultimately God's master plan. Uh, that, that has to be what God is talking about here. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let's uh, reflect for a moment on this keeping of the Sabbath. All right. That word keep is very important in the Old Testament. Shamar. Okay, this is a key critical word in Hebrew. In the Hebrew Old Testament, in a certain sense, you can tie up the whole story of salvation history. I think it's absolutely an essential word. 469 times it's used in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew books of the Bible. Um, and keep has a connotation of guard, okay? Observe. Um, you know, we got to observe, protect, guard, tend, take heed, beware, be careful. These are all different ways that this Hebrew word shamar is rendered. So it definitely has this sense of be vigilance, vigilance and guarding. And interestingly enough, the first time we hear this word used is in Genesis 2.15. 
when God sends Abraham into that garden, when he places the man in the garden, he tells him to cultivate or till the soil and uh, or the garden and to guard it or keep it. Uh, so, yeah, the very same word shamar is, uh, is used by God to instruct Abraham that he needs to guard this garden. It's oftentimes translated as keep, uh, but it really has this connotation of guard, and that's that's very important, I think, when you consider the whole context of uh, salvation history and how that word is used. It's used in so many different contexts. Uh, we are to uh, Adam's instruct to keep the garden, but we're also um, the same exact word keep um, is used for the commandments. We are to keep or guard the commandments. We are called to keep or guard the covenant. We are called to, in this case here, keep the Sabbath or guard the Sabbath. Observe the Sabbath, okay? Um, tend the Sabbath, because that's another connotation of this word is sometimes used for a flock. A shepherd must keep his sheep or tend his sheep or guard his sheep, okay? Uh, because they're very, very vulnerable little sheepies uh, from the wild beasts. Now, um, keep the Sabbath, keep the Sabbath. We gotta keep the Passover. God instructs Israel to keep the Passover, keep the Sabbath, the flock, the covenant. We also, priests and Levites are instructed to keep uh, the worship or the liturgical rites, uh, they are instructed to keep these things, the holy things, sacred. And uh, lastly, in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy uses this word shamar a ton. It's like Moses' uh, sermon to Israel on the plains of Moab before they enter the promised land. And he's uh, exhorting them, reminding them, and he tells them to keep, 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 keep. Shamar, so many times in Deuteronomy, is used. And to keep our soul. Uh, so it, it's, it's a very, very um, useful word uh, for our own spiritual life. Uh, which involves a certain guarding, you know, to um, uh, our Lord says in Luke uh, that we are to uh, uh, keep the word and do it. Okay, so, um, yeah, keep our soul. Let's uh, move on. But, uh, you know, we're going to hear that again, that, re that phrase repeated in chapter 56 here to keep the Sabbath, but we'll, we'll, that'll suffice for now. Uh, the son of man who holds it keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. What happens when we don't keep the Sabbath? What's interesting here about uh, the Sabbath itself is that, you know, this predates Israel, the formation of Israel. The Sabbath is something that is primordial that goes back to the primitive history of Israel from the very beginning. At the dawn of time, quite literally, uh, God created this day of Sabbath rest. So there's a sense of universality about the Sabbath. Um, that the Sabbath is kind of a chronological space, as it were, uh, that uh, time is this time, this particular day, uh, is to be kept holy and sacred, a day of rest uh, for not just Israel, but ultimately for the whole human race. God intended from the very beginning, it's his manifest will that one day be set apart for the worship of Almighty God as the creatures made in his image and likeness. We have this capacity to worship the Lord. We give voice. We give voice uh, on behalf of all of creation. We are the priests of creation, and we can worship. Uh, and uh, this is uh, not only an obligation, kind of a fundamental obligation we have on us, uh, but it's something good for us uh, to, to worship the Lord is good and holy for us. Uh, now, when we don't do it, what happens? 
What happened to Israel when they didn't do it? Well, they got overrun and uh, they were carried away by the beasts, all right, uh, namely the nations that uh, conquered them and enslaved them. So uh, that's what we hear. Uh, the explanation Nehemiah gives uh, during the return phase, the period of the return, Nehemiah calls Israel out on this point and says, you know, this is what got us into trouble in the first place, y'all. Did not your fathers act in this way? And did not our God bring all this evil on us and on this city? Yet you bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. So he's talking about the Sabbath here in chapter 13, verses 6, 15 and following here. Um, how, you know, they're working on the Sabbath day. And they're treading wine presses on the Sabbath and so on. And uh, he remonstrates with the religious leaders, uh, Nehemiah, to stop this practice. And, and he tells them, like, look, this is why you all went to Babylon in the first place. Uh, so anyway, and Jeremiah says the same thing. I suppose we can look at that too. Jeremiah 7, 27. Um, he basically says... Uh, seven, hold on, 1727, sorry, 1727 reads, but if you do not listen to me to keep the Sabbath day holy and not to bear a burden and enter by the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in its gates and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem and shall not be quenched. So Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jeremiah warns Jerusalem that uh, you are going to uh, be devoured, your palaces. Uh, you're going to um, be overrun by a foreign nation if you don't keep the Sabbath. Uh, so anyway, that's um, two examples of that. Now let's move on to verse 3. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say... The Lord will surely separate me from his people. Um, this is so interesting because it just falls in line with the whole theme of Isaiah. That uh, there's a universality, a kata, holocaust, vision or mission to God's plan of salvation to bring about this worldwide family reunion. Okay, And uh, the foreigners we've been hearing over and over again are going to be brought into the covenant brought up to the holy mountain to offer sacrifice, that God is going to unite all peoples, all tongues, all races, all nations uh, under his banner or under his sign, under this uh, signal he's going to raise for the nations. And uh, they are going to become part of this new Israel. That is uh, just awesome because that's why Isaiah is so fascinating to me because it, it's it unites the two covenants you know I think it's the hinge of um of the whole of the Bible it like reaches out into the new covenant and takes the old covenant and the new covenant and it kind of brings them together uh, there's just such a growth and development here Isaiah is a, he's a genius I mean he, of the magnitude of Saint Paul um, the man is just a towering figure. It's not only the biggest book of the Bible next to Psalms. It, it's the most quoted in the New Testament next to Psalms. And it is just absolutely saturated in the whole of the New Testament. Isaiah is permeates everything. Our Lord's thinking, St. Paul, the apostles. I mean, Isaiah is everywhere. And in our lectionary, we read Isaiah so much. Uh, our lectionary is just so replete with Isaiah. So I've been saying that over and over again, but uh, here's an example, another example of that. Isaiah gets it. Isaiah feels the heart of God. He knows God, this St. Paul of the Old Testament. And in Deuteronomy, it was pretty harsh a little bit at times. Uh, about separation from the nations in chapter 23, verses 1 to 6, particularly the Ammonites and the Moabites. You know, because they didn't help Israel when they were making their escape from Egypt, 
and they put up obstacles to them and actually made war upon them and and called you know the Ammonites call call uh Balak or Balaam to come curse Israel and every time he tries to curse them he ends up blessing them okay because God intervenes on Israel's behalf he cannot curse Israel um look um Israel hated hated that's a pretty strong word but they hated the Ammonites and the Moabites and in Deuteronomy 23 1 to 6 it says you know they are forbidden to worship the Lord in his holy temple not just for 10 generations but forever um so very interesting here that uh, basically Isaiah is reversing uh, that that dictate that dictum uh, of of Moses and saying actually let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say the Lord will will surely separate me from his people because God's uniting all his people including as hard as this is to accept the Ammonites and the Moabites I mean for crying out loud Ruth was David's great grandmother and guess where she was from Moab so David his very own great grandmother was a Moabite and um, uh, that is interesting very interesting uh, so look Nehemiah says the same thing in 13, 1 to 3. I suppose we can look at that real quick. Nehemiah 13, 1 to 3. What does he say? Um, On that day they read from the book of Moses, which is Deuteronomy, in the hearing of the people, and in it they found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. And um, so anyway, the people comply with this uh, dictum of of Moses and Deuteronomy here in Nehemiah. So you see that even after the Babylonian captivity during this return phase, this restoration period in Israel's history, they're still in compliance with uh, Moses' thinking here, Moses' exhortation uh, to exclude foreigners, uh, most notably the Ammonites and the Moabites from the warship. Um, <clears throat> But uh, Isaiah is saying, or God is saying through Isaiah, don't don't worry about it. Look, he's speaking directly to the foreigners. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. All right. God has the last word, not Moses. Okay. Um, and let not the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. Now, this is very interesting here because we all know who the eunuch was in Acts chapter 9, chapter 8. Uh, the eunuch that Philip, um, the eunuch from Ethiopia, this Ethiopian eunuch who's reading what? Isaiah chapter 53, the fourth suffering servant song. He's in his chariot and he's reading this and Philip hears him and he jumps up in the chariot and begins to exegete, explain uh, the meaning, starting with this passage, he explains G- who Jesus is, this Messiah that is spoken of in Isaiah 53. So let not the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. Um, Matthew 19, our Lord famously speaks about uh, the eunuchs, those who make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God. And I just wonder if there's a connection here between uh, what our Lord is saying in Matthew 19 and with uh, Isaiah 56, uh, because, yeah, the um, fact of the matter is the eunuchs aren't dry trees, right? They're going to be given a name, an everlasting name, a monument and a name, even though they don't have children, God's ways and thoughts are not our ways and thoughts. Okay, God sees things from an eternal perspective. Um, So he says, uh, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath and who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls 
a monument and a name. Better than sons and daughters. Better than sons and daughters. I mean, the blessing of children, and that's what it was considered by the Jews. It was a, considered a huge blessing. Uh, the the uh, um, Having children is a spiritual experience for parents. And uh, this is um, uh, something that it causes tremendous grief in a couple that can't have children. Or a barrenness is, is really considered a terrible curse on a couple and upon a woman who is found barren. We know that from many instances in salvation history. Uh, but look, you know, that's it's not the be-all, end-all having children in this world. As awesome and miraculous as it is, God says, look, if you're faithful to my covenant, you do the things that please me, keep my Sabbath holy, I will give you an everlasting name which shall not be cut off, a monument and a name that is better than sons and daughters. Ultimately, God's blessing is going to be manifest in the life of anybody, even if they don't have children like myself or anybody, a single person uh, who um, maybe feels remorseful that they never married and had kids or they're not able to or whatever the case may be um look we're not dry trees we're not dry trees our life can be fruitful in god's kingdom um <clears throat> when we serve god when we do what pleases him when we're faithful to his covenant uh it is bearing fruit and building for us a monument and a name even though we don't have offspring to carry on our family name uh, in God's eyes, <clears throat> uh, we are, in fact, our charity, our life's work uh, will bear fruit in the kingdom of God. And um, <clears throat> so, yeah, Matthew 19, I mean, the, there are some uh, who make themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven. And our Lord actually says, he who is able to receive this, let him receive it. <coughs> the fruitfulness of the celibate life. It's so fruitful that uh, I'm called father, even though I don't have any earthly children in the natural order. In the supernatural order, uh, I, I am a, a fruitful man, uh, even a father. Uh, in the spiritual order, the order of grace. Um, our Lord himself bore no earthly children. Um, so, all right, enough about that. Uh, let's move on here. Verse six. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister him to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants. Everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant these I will bring to my holy mountain. It's a rich, rich theme in Isaiah. And make them joyful in my house of prayer. Let's stop right there um, and talk about that mountain. Because it appears throughout uh, the book of Isaiah. I mean, Eden was presumably built on a mountain. I mean, there's a certain aspect of elevation to Eden. Why are four rivers flowing forth from it uh, if it isn't um, an elevated ground uh, flowing forth from this land? I mean, it, it's Edenic, Edenic. Uh, to think of Eden as a mountain is a very biblical image, okay? <clears throat> the holy mountain let's go back to isaiah chapter 2 and hear about that mountain in that day the branch of the lord shall be beautiful and glorious oh i'm sorry um it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it and many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and then we may walk in his paths. 
So look, I mean, there's always been this evangelization, this um, outreach to the nations. We've been saying that uh, throughout. God has always wanted to draw all the nations up to his holy mountain. Uh, and here they are going to be brought. These foreigners I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Um, 25, 6 to 8. Let's look at a couple other passages here. This is, this is powerful. <clears throat> Remember this one? On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of fat things, a feast of wine on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wine on the lees, well refined, and he will destroy on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. We are all his children. And um, lastly, yeah, we should take a peek ahead. Chapter 66 is like the grand finale of Isaiah here, where this point is hammered home about uh, the nations. Look, I am coming to gather all nations and tongues, 6618. And they shall come and shall see my glory, and I will set a sign among them. The sign of the cross is how we ought to interpret that more than likely. Um, and what do we hear about this mountain again? All And they shall bring all your people from all the nations as an offering to the Lord upon horses and chariots and litters to my holy mountain. Jerusalem, says the Lord, just as the Israelites bring their cereal offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord. And listen to this, this is astounding. Some of them also I will take for priests and for Levites, says the Lord. I am not Jewish. Uh, my family has done, my siblings, some of them have done the, uh, whatever that thing is with the take the saliva and check your DNA or whatever. I don't have any Jewish blood in me to my knowledge. <coughs> um, I'm mostly British Isles, mostly Ireland, okay? Even though I look Italian, some people think I'm Italian. Hey, yo, uh, but I also have some African in me, just a little bit of something interesting. What was it? North Africa. Anyway, maybe that explains how I get tan just by going in the sun a little bit. Um, but um, look, um, all flesh shall come to worship before me, all flesh to my holy mountain. Um, and they should be joyful in my house of prayer. I love that. To me, that uh, speaks to those who practice the faith, you know, sometimes we, we can resent those who do not practice the faith, who do not keep the Sabbath, uh, who are playing golf or going about their business and uh, cutting the grass, um, whatever they're doing. They're not coming to Mass. Most Catholics do not come to Mass, do not practice the faith, do not keep the Sabbath. And... <clears throat> Uh, they're in disobedience to the will, the manifest will of the Lord. From everything we know, from salvation history, he wants us to worship publicly once a week. To gather as his people, his creatures made in his image and likeness and give full public worship on the day of the Lord for us. Okay, that is our Sabbath as Christians. The day of the Lord's resurrection, the first day of the week, the day of the sun, the day of the pagans worship the sun God. All right, we worship the sun. All right, the son of God and the S-U-N son of justice. And uh, we gather to do this because it's manifestly our Lord's will. And it's what the church did from the very beginning at Pentecost. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, to fellowship or the communal life, to the breaking of the bread and the prayers. And when does scripture say in the New Testament that they did this on the Lord's day? is when they gathered to do this. 
uh, to celebrate the Mass, what we call the Mass, okay? The breaking of bread and the prayers and the reading are devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, which would eventually take shape into the New Testament, all right? And to fellowship with one another. This is God's will for us. And there are many who choose, elect not to do that. Now, rather than resent them, these, uh, you know, and feel like, oh, what a bunch of deadbeat Catholics, these C and ears, you know, Christmas and Easter Catholics, or they don't go at all, or, you know, hatch matching dispatchers, you know, they come for baptism, they come for marriage, and then they come back for their funeral, hatch match and dispatch, whatever the case may be. Look, for those of us who are keeping the Sabbath, um, who are really truly keeping the Sabbath, not just checking a box, doing this out of some sense of duty or obligation alone, but those who really love the Lord and are obedient servants of the Lord, his royal subjects, okay, who love the Lord and just delight in the Lord and in uh, uh, honoring him once a week uh, for our own good. Uh, we are joyful. Made joyful in the house of prayer, in this house of prayer, we're made, we experience a joy and a satisfaction, a delight that cutting the grass and reading the paper and mowing the lawn, I already said that, uh, and uh, playing golf or whatever we're doing uh, nowadays, you know, taking our kids to soccer practice or something on Sunday morning, uh, look, what we experience is true joy, something truly satisfying, fulfilling, gratifying um, that so far surpasses uh, those who deprive themselves of this joy. We ought to feel rather than resentment, pity for them, pity for them, sorrow for them, that they're missing out on this delight, this joy that we experience because we know who we are. The meaning of our very being and existence is ratified and reaffirmed every Sunday, every Lord's Day when we gather. We know exactly what we're doing, who we're doing at two and four, um, and we're obedient to the Lord, and we have a conscience that's at rest uh, in that knowledge. Uh, we're not plagued and haunted by this, um, you know, feeling of, that's got to be there in the back of people's minds. They know they're supposed to be going to church, and you know, but they've just fallen away, fallen away Catholics. Look, man, we got to feel sorrow and compassion for these people. And for those who've wandered far from God and his ways and are in most need of his mercy, who've really fallen for the ways of the world and are running after pursuits that are not in accordance with God and his ways. I mean, in, in really egregious ways. Those whose consciences have become retro reprobate, okay? Look, we got to feel these sorrow and compassion for these people. Yesterday was the Feast of Divine Mercy, okay? The mercy of God. He loves them. We ought to be praying for them and trying as best we can to evangelize souls which are never going to be happy, satisfied, or fulfilled. Look at Zacchaeus, you know, he's not happy or satisfied. Look at the Samaritan woman at the well. All these husbands she's had, our Lord said, look, you keep drinking of that well. You're just going to have to keep coming back here and dropping your bucket in there. Uh, you're, you're, never, you're always going to be thirsty again. I can give you something. A joy, a life will spring up inside of you. This, this living water will spring up inside of you, which can truly satisfy your heart. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. Will be accepted on my altar. These foreigners' sacrifices are going to be accepted on his altar. I mean, look. Back in chapter 19, this is just awesome to look back at and, and appreciate how radical this is for, for Isaiah to say this, that um, in Egypt, there's going to be altars to the living God, the God of Israel, the one true God in that day. There's going to be five different cities in the land of Egypt. 
who will swear allegiance to the Lord of hosts. And in that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord at its border. It will be a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt when they cry to the Lord because of oppressors. He will send them a savior. The Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians. And the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day and worship with sacrifice and burnt offerings. And they will make vows to the Lord and perform them. And the Lord will smite Egypt, smiting and healing, and they will return to the Lord, and he will heed their supplications and heal them. So ultimately, those who choose to go back to Egypt and uh, leave the practice of the faith, abandon their faith, if they ever had it, uh, we should judge them. If we grew up in their household, had their formation of the faith, we might be worse than they are, okay? We cannot judge them, but... We have to see them as God sees them, uh, that he wants to heal them and their sufferings that they're going to bring upon themselves, this emptiness that they feel inside in their quiet moments, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is this smiting. It's a smiting. But God is ready to heal them, ultimately. That pain is remedial. It's meant to bring them back to the Lord. And in that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. Oh my goodness, in that day, Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth. Egypt and Assyria. These two dreaded enemies of Israel are going to worship alongside Israel. Awesome. My house. Now, look. Uh, their sacrifices, these foreigners, will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. If Isaiah isn't feeling the heart of our Lord, why would our Lord quote this passage, remember? Our Lord quotes this passage when he enters Jerusalem triumphantly on his colt. And then he drives out the money changers from the temple. Where are they? They're in the court of the Gentiles doing something that is illicit according to the law of Moses. Uh, they are buying and selling things uh, in the court of the Gentiles, all right? The nations, the peoples, where the foreigners are permitted to come to worship in the outer precinct of the temple that's where this money changing, lending, selling, buying is going on. This is abomin an abomination to the Lord because it's inhibiting foreigners from coming there for this intended purpose of that court that uh, they discover the one true God. So it's really a refusal to accept Israel's fundamental mission uh, to reach out to this outreach to the nations to introduce them to the one true and living God, all right? And they're not doing it. And our Lord is furious at them and drives them out. And what does he do? He quotes this passage right here from Isaiah chapter 56. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples, all peoples. Our Lord's outreach certainly went out to all these foreigners. Think of the Syrophoenician woman, uh, the centurion. I mean, our Lord just goes out of his way to um, reach out to these uh, foreigners, to the nations. Uh, think of the uh, uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan. I mean, our Lord makes this so super abundantly clear. He is in sync with Isaiah because he is the one who inspired Isaiah. Okay, so you just see the heart of our Lord when you're reading Isaiah. Uh, and you see how deeply inspired, how deeply inspired and acquainted Isaiah was with the mind and heart of God, with the mind and heart of our Lord. Isaiah, oh, he is the man. Thus says the Lord who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. Hey, 
Once again, our Lord is right in sync with Isaiah here. There's going to be others, yet others, that I will gather besides those already gathered here, namely Israel, namely the Jews. Okay, um, <clears throat> there are others that the Lord wants to gather. And uh, this is in the context of everything here. Ultimately, it's the nations, the peoples. So this is really super evident in John's gospel. John says this numerous times, or we should say our Lord says this in John's gospel in numerous places. Uh, he says, look, I am the good shepherd and I have other sheep, other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will heed my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd, other sheep. Um, I have other sheep who are not of this fold. Oh man, the heart of our Lord. And his, uh, his heart is reaching out uh, to the nations. Now, uh, let's look at 11.52. And once again, here we have uh, in John's gospel, Caiaphas makes this prophetic statement. Um, you know, you do not understand that it is expedient for you that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should not perish Okay, and he did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation. Now listen to what John adds here. And not for the nation only, but to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Right. Now, all the children of God. Lastly, let's look at John 17, the high priestly prayer of our Lord. This is the climactic moment of um, our Lord before he enters into his passion in John's gospel, this high priestly prayer to his heavenly father. Um, <clears throat> and what does he say about his apostles? Listen to this. I do not pray for these only. He's, he's praying over his apostles. I do not pray for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Um, and that's exactly what's going to happen. They're going to go out to the ends of the earth. Take this gospel out to the ends of the earth. Go out and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. To the ends of the earth, our Lord sends them. I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. This is just simply found in Isaiah. So much of the New Testament is just anticipated by Isaiah. Um, <clears throat> it is the hinge of the Bible I would maintain that the Messiah is going to be a light to the nations to bring his salvation to the ends of the earth. Don't forget the first suffering servant song here in chapter 42, 1 to 6. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations covenant to the people and a light to the nations lastly we might as well turn to the book of revelation and hear a description of the fulfillment of all of this in the kingdom of god when you hear the prayers of the saints and they sang this new song saying worthy art thou to take the scroll and open its seals for thou wast slain and by thy blood didst ransom men for god Isaiah 53, from every tribe and tongue and people and nation and has made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on earth. So the very prayers of the saints in heaven, this new song they're singing, people of every race and tongue and nation are singing this song. They've been made priests to our God. Very interesting. Um, now, all you, so here we're now going to have this rebuke, uh, this rebuke of the shepherds or the watchmen, really the prophets and rulers and priests of Israel are supposed to be their watchmen, but they're not doing their job. They're blind and without knowledge. 
and uh, and they're dumb. They're they're like dumb dogs who cannot bark. An intruder comes into the house and they don't bark. You ever been to somebody's house that has a dog like that? That's mostly blind, so old it can barely get up, and it just wags its tail at you. Okay, and um, you're like, wow, man, if I came here to to rob this house or to do harm to these people, this dog is just useless. All right, that's the comparison God makes to these watchmen, these priests and rulers and prophets, okay, of Israel. All you beasts of the field, come in to devour. All you beasts in the forest. Why? Because his watchmen are blind. They are all without knowledge. They are all dumb dogs that cannot bark. Uh, 513, this is a theme, not having understanding. We've talked about repeatedly, but... Uh, Lacking understanding is what got them into trouble in the first place. 513 in Isaiah. Therefore, my people go into exile for want of knowledge. The shepherds of Israel, these watchmen, the rulers, priests, prophets, they're supposed to be watchmen and they're supposed to impart understanding and um and they have no understanding themselves. The shepherds also have no understanding. They've all turned to their own way, to their own gain, one and all. And they just fill themselves with wine and strong drink. This harkens back to Isaiah 28 and the drunkards of Ephraim. Okay, this is going to be something, a theme here. Uh, taking care of themselves. Yeah, these uh, supposed shepherds, you know, who really Lamb based the shepherds on this account is Ezekiel chapter 34. He just blasts them and prophesies against the shepherds. And what's so interesting here is he just blasts them. Ho, oh, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? Okay, they're gonna get they're gonna be held to a much higher standard. To whom more has been given, more will be required. So we ought to be careful if we step up to serve the Lord and wear, put one of these funny things on around our neck. Uh, we're going to be held accountable for this tremendous gift uh, we've been given to be a shepherd, to be a pastor. Okay, If we're not pastoring our flock, uh, we're going to get in big, big trouble. All right, And finally, the Lord just says, I'll tell you what, y'all aren't doing your job, these shepherds. Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and I will seek them out. Verse 15, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I will make them lie down. Isn't this exactly what John says? Our Lord says in John's gospel, chapter 10, you know, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. I came that they may have, may have life and have it abundantly. The good shepherd lays his life down for his sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my own know me. Our Lord is the good shepherd. The fulfillment of this prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 34 that God finally just says, look, I myself, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I will search out and seek the lost. All right, um, so moving on, um, I think that's pretty much chapter 56, and uh, you know what? I thought I was going to get through chapter 57, but I'm out of time. Only did one chapter, but it's a good chapter, and a lot of good stuff in there, but I can't wait to do 57, so we'll hit that next time. God bless you.